Your TA Indiana came here today for two reasons, helping you understand forced convection and eating popsicles. And we're all out of popsicles. So this problem falls under the category of external forced convection. Internal convection would be flow through a pipe. External convection is when the flow is outside the object, external. And forced convection as opposed to natural convection because forced means that the fluid is actually moving. Natural convection, there would not be actual flow. The only motion would be created by like hot air rises and cold air sinks. That causes motion in natural convection. And the shape for this problem is going to be a cylinder in cross flow. This means that the air is flowing perpendicular to the cylinder, at least outside of it. Externally forced convection with cross flow over cylinder is gonna be the main aspect of this problem, but there's actually four different types of heat transfer happening. So I'm gonna use the actual bricks themselves of this chimney as my control volume. So in green is the exhaust gases. This is the whole point of the chimney is that hot gases enter the bottom of the chimney, they cool off as they rise through the chimney, and then they are colder when they actually escape to the atmosphere at the top. So all of that M dot CP delta T, right? All of that energy that is lost by the exhaust gases, that all enters the brick of the chimney. We also have solar radiation hitting the chimney, right? This is just the heat from the sun that's hitting the outside of the brick. And from the, from the chimney itself, it doesn't matter whether the heat is coming from the outside or from the inside. From a conservation of energy point of view, all the energy entering the control volume is heat in. That's my left side of my equation, left side. So then my right side is all of the energy leaving the control volume. And this is gonna leave due to thermal radiation. That is, we expect the surface of the chimney to be very hot, so it will radiate heat out to its surroundings. And then also the forced convection due to this 10 meter per second wind that is blowing across the surface of the cylinder. Easy parts first, we already have everything we need for the green exhaust gases. We can find the energy as M dot CP delta T. We don't need to model this as an internal forced convection problem. We could, but we don't need to because we already know the change in temperature. Right? If we know the change in temperature in the flow rate, we can figure out the amount of energy without having to actually do internal force convection and finding H and all that. We'll leave that for other problems. So this is just kind of a thermodynamics review. 57,600 watts is the energy lost by the exhaust gases as they flow through the chimney. So for the solar radiation, I'm making kind of a bad assumption, but stick with me. So when the sun's energy hits the earth, it gives us about 1400 watts per meter squared. If we assume that the chimney has an absorptivity of 0.9, that means 90% of that 1400 actually gets absorbed, right? With other parts being say reflected, for example. So if we just know the area, then we can figure out the amount of energy that's being absorbed. So the surface area of a cylinder is the perimeter times the height, so pi d times l, I get 31.42 meters squared as the total surface area of the chimney. And then when I multiply this out, I get about 39,000 and change watts as the amount of energy absorbed by the chimney from the sun. Now, if you're thinking critically, you're gonna recognize a few flaws with the area that I'm using here. The sun only points from one direction. It can't possibly hit the area on the back side of the chimney. And also the chimney is, is round, it's not flat. So if you remember from your fluid mechanics class drag problems, you would normally model drag, right? Like wind hitting an object, you would actually just find the cross-sectional area of a bluff body in order to calculate sort of the area that the sun is hitting. And so if the sun were coming perfectly from the side, a better area would be 10 times one, just the vertical rectangular cross section, so 10 meters squared. But then that's not great either because it depends on the direction of the sun. The expensive solar panels are placed on motors, so they actually rotate at different times of day, so they're always pointing directly at the sun. At noon, when the sun is directly overhead, right, the sun would only actually be hitting the top circular cross section. It wouldn't be hitting the sides at all. So for this problem, the totally unrealistic assumption being made 
is that the solar radiation hits the entire surface area of the chimney. Not realistic, but let's move on. So thermal radiation. So I'll grab the thermal radiation equation out of the FE reference manual. We are given an emissivity of 0.9. Stefan Boltzmann constant is just a constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight. The cross-sectional area of 31.42, now this time that is actually a good correct surface area. It should be the actual full wrapped around surface area. And then we've got two temperatures raised to the fourth power and these have to be in Kelvin. Since you're doing multiplication with them, raising them up to a power, they have to be in Kelvin. So 300.15 Kelvin, not 27 Celsius. But finally we reached an equation where now we have the actual variable we're looking for, TS, the temperature at the surface of the chimney. So we can't get it to an actual answer for Q dot rad, but we've done all we can for now. So let's move on to the purple, the actual point, right? The, the big term, the externally forced convection. So, you're, so when your TA Serenity is really happy, her tail sticks straight up, which is just like the chimney in today's convection problem. Since air is the fluid flowing over the cylinder, we're gonna need a bunch of different properties. And so I head back to my table, and this is where you're gonna have to make an assumption for T film. You need to evaluate air properties at the film temperature. And by convention, we assume that the film temperature is halfway in between the surface temperature and the ambient air temperature. So since our fluid is at 300 Kelvin, I'm gonna make a guess that the surface temperature is 400 Kelvin, just to make a nice round number, which will make my film temperature halfway in between 350 Kelvin. At the very end of the problem, if my guess of 400 Kelvin for the surface temperature, if that's really far off, then I'll need to use that answer to come up with a new film temperature, get a bunch of new properties and go back through the math and come up with a new final answer. So try to make a good guess because you do not want to have to work through this problem twice. So one thing I hate is having to go back to a same table to look up numbers. So I'm going to write down everything, even though I don't know which ones I'm going to need. So density, CP, viscosity, other viscosity, Prandtl number. All right, and we probably did not actually need both viscosities because for Reynolds number, I like just using the new, the like script V version of viscosity because then Reynolds number is just V D over new. So my 10 meters per second, one meter diameter, and then my V shaped viscosity, 2.069 times 10 to the minus five. And I get a pretty big Reynolds number, about 483,000. And your TA Indy is standing up because he's very frustrated with me because he knows that in the next step, I'm actually gonna need the thermal conductivity K which I did not write down from the table after that whole thing about not wanting to have to go back to the tables. So thanks to help from your TA Andy, we've got K 0 0.03 watts per meter Kelvin. And the reason we're gonna need that is because the Nusselt number is defined involving H, D, and K. So if we wanna rearrange this to find H, it's gonna be K divided by D times the Nusselt number. And the frustrating thing about convection is that equations are not really determined from first principles. Like we didn't take some, like we didn't make a perfect model and take some integrals and solve for what the actual answer is. It's just impossible to actually model turbulent flow to that level of accuracy. So almost all of the convection equations you're gonna find are actually fit equations. That is, we ran dozens or hundreds or thousands of experiments and collected a mountain of data, and then we came up with either simple or extraordinarily complex equations that fit the data pretty well. So the easiest version of these equations is listed in the FE reference manual. And actually there's multiple versions of the equation because in fact, it's so simple that it isn't very good. And in fact, the version of the equation only works over very narrow ranges of the Reynolds number. And our Reynolds number is so big, it doesn't even fit into this table. So I'm gonna work through this just to show you how it works, but I'm actually gonna solve it sort of a, the better way next. 
So the version in the FE reference manual has Nusselt number for external convection over a cylinder as a coefficient times Reynolds number to a power times Prandtl number to a power. So I'll use the largest Reynolds number that's in the table. It gives me a coefficient about 0 0.026 and an exponent 0 0.805. And you may notice that this actually looks very similar to an internal forced convection equation. And there are good reasons why it ends up being similar. Once you get to turbulent flow where all kinds of stuff is happening, flow inside and outside end up being pretty similar. So I also multiply by K over D up front to get H instead of just the Nusselt number. And my value ends up being 26.7. And I'm gonna make a note here, this is kind of suspect because we use this equation even though our Reynolds number was not in range, but it makes for a useful comparison. But now you know, if you wanna use this equation, just match up the row in this little table with your Reynolds number and plug and chug, and it's actually super quick and easy. Speaking of, speaking of super quick and easy, look at this gigantic beast. So, so here is the equation that we're actually gonna use. Is this not the most stupidly complex equation you've seen in your whole college career? We've got something raised to the two thirds, raised again to the one fourth, raised to the five eighths, again raised to the four fifths, right? This is, this is properly crazy. So let me show you a plot to explain why this is so insane looking. So this chart is published by a totally free heat transfer textbook by Leinhard. And these hundreds of circles in this plot all represent an experiment that an engineer and scientist conducted, right? So there's hundreds of experiments by a bunch of different professors in different countries all over the world, all compiled in one chart. And so this big disgusting equation we're using does a surprisingly good job of tracking this experimental data over the entire range of values. So you can get away with using this every single time, doesn't matter what range your Reynolds number is in, this equation is gonna be pretty good. However, there are some ranges where another equation is better. And in particular, in this middle section, between like 40,000 and 200,000 Reynolds number, you'll see that our solid line equation is actually a little bit below the experimental data. So right after, basically right after turbulent flow starts, the experimental data kind of jumps upwards a little bit. And so that's where you can see that there are several other versions of this equation that look similar or a little bit easier or just as complicated. So we've got one equation that works over the entire range that's pretty good everywhere, but there are other equations that are better than this one only for very specific narrow ranges. But for this specific problem now, with a Reynolds number of 483,000, which is pretty big, I'm just gonna keep the, the default equation, the one that's kind of safe to use every single time. So rearranging for H, I've got K over D, so Indy helped us find that 0 0.03 value before. So we've got 0.3 plus 0.62 times the Reynolds number, and the Prandtl number 0 0.702. We've got another 0 0.702 in the denominator. We've got the 483,000 again over there on the right. And there's no way I would ever risk typing this whole expression into my calculator all at once. So I'm gonna break it up into some smaller pieces. But then eventually I get to an H value convection coefficient of 20.32. So this ended up being a little bit lower than the one we got using the FE reference manual equation, but is on the same order of magnitude. So that's kind of reassuring that I didn't make a completely egregious calculator mistake. So then the actual convection equation is just regular H A delta T. This new 20.32, the surface area, the entire surface area, 31.42, times the change in temperature. It's often safe to leave temperatures in Celsius when you're doing a delta T, because if you just add 273 to both of them, it cancels out. But since we had to leave the radiation temperatures in Kelvin, these temperatures also have to be in Kelvin so that it's the, the same number in different parts of the equation. So let's head back to my original conservation of energy equation. Green energy from the exhaust gases, 57,000. The red energy term from impact from solar radiation. The orange term from emitting thermal radiation. And then the purple term from the external forced convection with cross flow over a cylinder. There's probably a way to solve a fourth order polynomial, but I am not interested in learning it. I'm just gonna solve this numerically by graphing it. If I subtract the constants from the left side over to the right side, I can just plot y equals that big expression. 
And wherever it crosses the x-axis, right, wherever it equals zero, that will be the answer, right? And that gives me a surface temperature of 405 Kelvin or 132 degrees Celsius. And so remember back at the beginning when we made an assumption for the film temperature. We need to actually verify that that assumption was valid. So the film temperature is just the average between the temperature of your flowing fluid and the surface temperature. And that gives us 352 Kelvin, which is very close to our assumption of 350, which of course makes total sense because I super cheated on this and I already knew what the answer was gonna be back when I chose my film assumption. So in your case, you won't actually know the value, so there may be some times when your answer is not very close. And if that happens, unfortunately, the way to finish is to go back, find different properties for all of your air values, different K, different Prandtl number, and to run through all the math again to get to an answer. But instead of starting the problem over, let's just watch your TAND eat his popsicle for a couple of seconds, and then if you wanna watch another convection video, that's linked up on the screen here.